What do you mean you forgot to lock the Grey's cages? Do you remember what happened last time? Look, I got a debunk video to shoot, so I'll look into it later. Greetings all. I'm back with a long overdue debunk of more Flat Earth stupidity. Now let's get started. So flatties like to claim the sun is local. Well, that's completely stupid. For argument's sake, let's put that to the test. Now I'm going to assume a flat earth. They're flat baseline triangles, quote unquote perspective, and inverse square of light. In other words, I'm gonna do the work that flat earthers refuse to do or can't do. So no globe maths, no spinning pear-shaped balls, just the flurf assumption of a flat earth local sun. Now let's get started. One of the core precepts of celestial navigation is an observed celestial object will drop one degree for every 60 nautical miles, or 69.05 miles. Using this precept, that has been part of celestial navigation for hundreds of years, we are going to triangulate the distance to the sun. So with a base of 69.05 miles, 90 degrees for the sun's GP, and a sighted angle of 89 degrees, let's triangulate that height. The completed triangle gives us 3,955.87 miles for the height of the sun above a flat, planar Earth using perfect triangles or 39.56 miles. See? Flat Earth and triangles! If you Flat Earthers want to cry foul, guess what? What I did was use the very methodology that Nathan Oakley and Quantum Eraser said could be done to triangulate the height. No globe maths, no magic numbers, just what Nathan Oakley and Quantum Eraser claimed how it could be done on their own live show, Flat Earth Debate 1542. When it comes to the height of the star, I have no idea how you're going to solve for that with triangles. The distance, yes. Yeah, you do. It's the right there. Tangent theta the equals opposite over adjacent. Yeah, but how, how do you tell the height of the star above the surface of the Earth? You can't tell the height of it. You're going to give it an angle. I just told you. <laughs> We're not trying to calculate the yeah. height of the stars. We're trying to calculate the distance to the GP above the star, Brian. You're just not utilizing it to give you the height. Could you back engineer it and do that? Yeah. Now, the angular size of the sun directly overhead is like 32 minutes of arc. So if we use perspective, physical size versus distance versus angular size, perspective says if the sun is 32 minutes of arc in angular size and 3,956 miles up, this results in a diameter of 36.823 miles or 37 miles. So using that celestial navigation, one degree of drop for 69.05 miles, triangles, and a flat planar Earth, we have a sun that's 37 miles diameter and 3,956 miles above the ground. Now we need to find out what the GP of the sun is so that we can get the hypotenuse. In other words, the distance to the sun from the observer. Once we have that, we can calculate the angular size for the sun for rise and set, and for 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So, using the co-angle method, 90 degrees and our 39.56 miles, here's what the distance to the GP would be for rise and set. It gives us, well... 6,214.49 miles from the observer. See? No spinning pear-shaped ball maths. All the same thing you guys have seen Oakley and crew do tons of times. Again, using co-angle, 90 degrees and so on, this is the distance to the GP for 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. 3,107 0.25 miles from the observer. Now let's move on. Now we can all agree the sun just doesn't sit directly above our heads 24-7. It changes its location in our skies as the day progresses. So at sunrise on the equinox, when viewed at the equator, it's at the horizon. At 9 a.m., it's about 45 degrees above the horizon. 
At noon, it's 90 degrees above the horizon or directly overhead. At 3 p.m., it's 45 degrees again. And at set, it's again at the horizon. Now your quote unquote perspective is still physical size versus distance versus angular size. And the distance to the local sun would be different at those times. So again, using your flat earth, it can only be triangles and 69.05 miles per degree drop. Well, let's calculate what those distances would be. Here we use the height based on the 69.05 mile per degree drop on a flat baseline triangle, the resulting diameter according to perspective, and the flat baseline flat earth triangle distance for those times, we get the following. At rise, it would be 7,366 miles from the observer. At 9 a.m., 5,030 miles from the observer. Now, perspective dictates that any object will change angular size as its distance changes. So, let's calculate what that angular size would be for those times. At rise, it would be 17.268 minutes of arc, which is a 49% decrease in angular size. At 9 a.m., it would be 25.287 minutes of arc, which is around a 20 to 21 percent decrease in angular size at noon again 32 minutes of arc at 3 p.m 25.287 minutes of arc again and at set 17.268 minutes of arc again so let's review at rise and set it should look 46 percent smaller at 9 a.m and 3 p.m the sun should be 21 percent smaller this change in angular size would also need to be accounted for when using a sextant in celestial navigation. However, there is no table or calculation used in navigation that accounts for this significant change in angular size. So not even your only on flat earth sextant claims will save you. But we aren't done yet. We still need to address inverse square law, or how the sun will get dimmer as distance increases. According to inverse square law, the brightness of the sun from the point of the observer would also diminish as the sun moves further away. So if we give the noon sun a value of 100 and calculate for 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and rise and set, we get the following. At rise, the luminosity will be 28.8%. At 9 a.m., 61.8%. At noon, of course, 100%. Then again at 3 p.m., 61.8%, and at set, 28.8%. Now, because I don't feel like doing all the calculations over and over every time a flat earther throws out some random distance claim, I made a calculator that will give me even more accurate results for any distance a flatty wants to make up. So, here's what that looks like in action. Considering flat earthers need pretty pictures, I'll be nice and show the sun video with all the factors accounted for. But wait. This exact same thing also applies to the moon and constellations. So let's have a look at what it would look like for the sun, moon, and the constellation of Orion. Now I know flat earthers again are going to cry foul, but here's the thing. I've stacked the deck in favor of flat earth on all this. In fact, I presupposed perfectly clear atmosphere that in no way negatively affects what you should see. So any claims you flat earthers want to make about refraction and lensing and so on actually makes the results even worse for you. Prime example, lensing is subject to inverse square law as well. So claiming lensing to maintain same angular size would make the sun, moon, and stars even dimmer still. Hell, even the air in the room right now where you're watching this video would result in a negative effect. Now, where does that leave us? Even when I stack everything in favor of flat earth, using flat baseline triangles for your flat earth, and the methodology outlined by flat earthers, it still fails. Now, if you flat earthers want to come at me on this, go ahead. But if you don't do the same level of work, show your calculations, and demonstrate how your resulting calculations backs your claim, 
You're being nothing but a third string benchwarmer flatty that lacks the intelligence and capability of independent thought to even back your claims with your own words. In short, your flat earth with your whining about perspective and rants about flat baseline triangles debunks flat earth's local sun, moon, and stars. Well, that's it, folks. I didn't dig as deep as I could have. But it's rather obvious that Flat Earth claims debunk Flat Earth. Later. This is going to take forever to get straightened out. Harvey, Harvey, put down that anal probe right now. There's no rednecks on the ship.